academics webinar. Today we'll be talking about sharing with the public and getting the academy to count it. And I'm joined by my co-moderator, Kara Akabak, who's an assistant professor at Notre Dame. And I am joined by several panelists who were authors on two papers in our academics issue. Mark Kissel, who's an assistant professor at Appalachian State, Laura Durgovich, who's a postdoc at Harvard, Katie Hind, professor at Arizona State University, Kim Tommy, who's a PhD candidate at Witt Watersand, and John Hawks, who's a professor at Wisconsin Madison. And um, during this webinar today, if you have any questions, we really encourage you to use our Q&A function. Um, you should see in the webinar um, a questions tab where you can type in questions and we will be moderating that and um, definitely encourage questions for all of our panelists today. So if we want to go ahead and get started, um, I think we can turn it over to Kara uh, to get us started with the questions for our panelists. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Delaney, for that nice introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, for an early morning webinar for the AABA. Thank you for folks who are not on East Central time zone for getting up so early for us today. So we have this wonderful panel of, of, of individuals who are committed to public engagement uh, across a variety of formats and, and programs and platforms. And so rather than assign you to each of your own publications, because that could get dry and boring, uh, how about you each tell us about your own public engagement activities uh, that you have recently been engaged in? And you're going to be at the mercy of where your picture is on my screen. So <laughs> apologies up front. Laura, you are the first to go. Let us know a little bit about your public engagement. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I am engaged in a couple different public facing endeavors right now. Um, Katie and Mark and I are all gearing up for the 10th annual Mammal March Madness, which is very exciting for all of us. Uh, so we are uh, I've been engaged in that uh, as part of the organizing team for about five years now. I was an avid player initially, and then I managed to worm my way into the inner circle. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm also engaged with uh, Skype a Scientist, which is a nonprofit program that uh, many people may have heard of before that connects classrooms mostly with scientists so that uh, young kids especially can ask questions and and get to see that scientists are not always um, people in white lab coats who are off in the ivory tower, but are in fact uh, real people and, and have real interests. And uh, I also have a TED talk that I did a couple years ago um, that's available that uh, is about evolutionary medicine and uh, has, last I checked, um, north of 2 million views. So um, that's, that's been a lot of fun for me to to watch that those numbers climb over the years. Um, so, yeah, that uh, those are those are some of the basics of what I engage in. Okay, thank you, Laura. Katie, yeah. you're up next, and I'm going to insist on you explaining the weedy cereal box covers for this year's March Mammal Madness and the amazing question mark lemur tails. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Katie Hind, and um, my principal area of research is um, in the area of maternal and child health, specifically around lactation, breastfeeding, and milk composition, and how that um, is shaped by a mother's environment and how that variation can influence infant development. And I um, was really interested as a graduate student in these questions from an evolutionary kind of perspective. But as I was finishing up my PhD, I realized that conducting work to just satisfy my own curiosity was not the pathway to a fulfilling career. And I began to work very hard at communicating what my findings in an evolutionary anthropology uh, space meant for the numerous stakeholders in family health. So I started very systematically thinking about what is meaningful in my work for families making infant feeding decisions or navigating infant feeding obstacles. 
um, what's important for policymakers, what's important for clinicians, and then at the same time, listening to those communities about what they were grappling with and what would be useful for them. And so it became this really important bi-directional kind of process where their perspectives informed my work and my work was, was intentionally shared more broadly. And, and so that was really how I first became quite committed to knowledge translation and science communication. Um, and then kind of um, probably for a variety of, of reasons, including an overabundance of personality, I began doing more kinds of outreach talks about broader topics and then kind of um, almost by accident started what is now March Mammal Madness. And, uh, and it's grown um, incrementally, sometimes by big increments every year for the last 10 uh, tournaments. And this has been a, a major area of kind of structured uh, science outreach um, that in many ways grew in tandem with work that I had done on sexual harassment and sexual assault in the academy. Right? So those topics are very depressing. They're um, horrible experiences um, that are happening to my colleagues and uh, oftentimes being done by other colleagues. And that's a really dark place to sit in. And your regular research work is not the escape you'd want it to be because you know work, research is really hard. And so um, I found myself leaning into March Memo Madness as an opportunity to really revisit the enthusiasms of my youth of, of awe at nature and the natural world and kind of leaning into a festival kind of experience. And so in many ways, the aspects of my side come are about my own self-care and sustainably engaging in academia. So uh, I'm gonna let other people introduce and we can circle back to the lemur tales and our promotional materials for the 10th annual in a little bit. I just talked for a long time. Yeah, no, that's fine. But I'm not letting you off the hook when it comes to the Wheaties box, <laughs> just so you know. And Mark, long time no see, you and I were just in the same space, what, two weeks ago for, for webinar number two. So welcome back. Tell us a bit about your science communication and outreach. Yeah. Um... I had two people to prep and I was just listening to everybody rather than thinking of a good answer. Um, <laughs> I'd say, uh, so I, my sort of positionality is I was, uh, to be open, but I was John Hawkins' grad student and, you know, John was very good very early on and sort of the science communication make, showing that it's important to, do, I'm not going to steal his story, but showing that it's important to like talk about what we do. And um, what I'd say maybe is different is, and sort of like Katie sort of trying to sort of think about how does the work we do really matter. A lot of my recent science of science communication has been going to um, uh, theology, theologians, going to sort of uh, ministries, th those kind of places, seminary schools, and talking to them about, you know, sometimes evolution, but mostly about why science matters. Because so many of them have told me that, you know, their parishioners come to them with science questions. And oftentimes the only scientist they've ever met is like their doctor and how their doctors don't listen to them, right? Because this is a huge thing in, in medical uh, profession now. So how to sort of have those conversations. And I'd say they're not always easy because sometimes, you know, we're coming from radically different places and different sort of ways of seeing the world. But, you know, there's a lot of really amazing work done by theologians with liberation theology, all this really great work. So I think a lot of my work now, uh, other than, and then of course, you know, as Alara pointed out, somehow March happens like five times out of the year now. And it's a lot of, I mean, I'm excited about March Mellow Madness, but also it is, um, it's coming up pretty quickly now. So uh, that is, um, and then like, you know, just trying to do podcasts like this and appearing on every other AABA seminar. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Kim, you're up next. Thank you so much for having me um, representing the, the South <laughs> down in, in South Africa. Um, really appreciate being here and, and learning from everyone and sharing our knowledge on, on this amazing field that I'm so passionate about. Um, so my SciComm work, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. I was strong armed into a fame lab um, competition as an honor student. So just after undergrad in South Africa, and that was 2015 um, by Dr. Christine Steininger. And, and I will mention her name because she is 
tiny but mighty and she did not take no for an answer so uh she kind of started my journey in in psychom um after fame lab i really was drawn more to writing so i was named one of the south african young academy of sciences top 20 postgraduate writers in 2017 um i've gone on to be a freelance script writer for eons pbs which is just oh, the best thing to ever ever get involved with such a great team um and and the videos that we've created i've tried to really highlight the south african fossil record and the african fossil record so mostly focusing on discoveries from eastern africa um, as well as south africa and branching beyond anthropology which was quite difficult um and and starting to look at these ancient beasts that were <laughs> on the landscape which was so far beyond um what I'm, I'm really used to, but such a great challenge to be able to just highlight the richness of the African fossil record. So I would say my SICOM um, really tries to bring an African perspective. I think in biological anthropology and specifically in paleoanthropology, um, a lot of work that's done is often done by foreigners, um, whether that be research work, whether that be science communication work, we don't really have a lot of representation of African voices and African scholars. Um, so that's kind of been the driving force for me is to highlight that we've got amazing researchers and that we've got this wealth and abundance of heritage and just trying to ensure that we are speaking um, our own truths and speaking for ourselves when it comes to a science that is um, largely well, historically largely extractive in, in South Africa. So um, I've gone on to, like I said, work for eons, um, podcasting, you could you could find me anywhere. I, I kind of dabble in, in everything. I'll give everything a chance. I might not be the greatest at it, but I will try, um, but mostly sticking to, to writing. And also then I started doing quite a lot of Psycom on Twitter. Um, mostly addressing issues in the academy, issues related to um, tertiary education in South Africa, related to representation, transformation, diversity, inclusion. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, the, the scope of my psychom. That's a really wonderful and broad scope for someone who is still getting their PhD. That is a lot of time and a lot of effort. So that's incredibly it's like impressive. I don't like rest. Yeah, Carter, thank you. It's, it's <laughs> truly like I don't enjoy rest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and last but certainly not least, John Hawks. Well, thanks so much. Listen, I want to add on Kim's behalf. She's one of the first science superheroes in South Africa and and is making a huge difference in 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 education as well as in the professional realm of communication it is such a big thing um i also want to amplify what she said about our science having historically been extractive you know for me the most important engagement that i do in my engaged scholarship is rooted in uh working with and finding ways to better serve the communities where i work and that includes for me, for a long time, South Africa, uh, where we're working with World Heritage Site, with uh, government on several levels. We work with tourism. Uh, we try to make jobs, find ways to build the country and find ways to build interest in heritage. And I've been privileged to work uh, with the Maripeng Museum and support some of Kim's work. I think that kind of work for anthropologists especially those of us who are in north american institutions is not always super visible it's not always super visible to the public and the public around us i make a huge effort in wisconsin in particular and and more broadly in in north america with engaging with groups on science and what science has to offer you and, uh, and, and what our human heritage is about, the importance of heritage. Um, so my most important public facing work, engaged work is really sort of small group work. I've been privileged to be able to work on uh, and consult with a number of documentary productions. And I, I love that kind of work. I love the impact that it has on people um, that are not in other ways, you know, engaged with science necessarily. Uh, but being able to 
really feature some of the amazing work that my colleagues do and and find ways to fit in stories that that broaden people's understanding of their history that's that's really important to me i do a lot of writing and and have blogged for many years and and we have that i think later on the agenda so so i won't say a ton about that but i will say that i work um every year i i work with between 50 and 100 journalists on stories related to human origins and and making sure that a an expert commentary is available to contextualize new work i always try to do so in in a positive but but you know critical when necessary way and uh and i find that work to be really uh really important uh so so that's kind of the range of stuff that i do thanks so much for all those responses um i feel like there's so much i want to linger on um, I guess to start off, the first thing I'd like to linger on um, <clears throat> is, you know, I think all of you have kind of mentioned this idea that, you know, there's an iterative process between public engagement and research, um, and you're all involved in so many activities, right? Like TED Talks, you know, engaging with the public, um, podcasts, et cetera. I myself, obviously, am on Sausage of Science on the Sausage of Science podcast, so I'm you know, dabbling in science communication. Um, and I guess I would love to know what is the importance of doing these activities? And the second part to my question is how to balance that necessity or the importance of those activities when and if those activities are not necessarily valued by the academy. Um, and this is especially true for people earlier in their career, maybe in graduate school, trying to find out like if science communication and if public engagement is worth their time, right? So I would love to know uh, all of your thoughts on that. And maybe we can start with, I don't know if I wanna put anybody on the spot, but maybe we can start with Mark. Awesome. Um, so I guess for the, the second part of your question, right, about sort of worried about is it going to count, um, I read this, I think it was Cook et al, like 2017, this great piece about science communication, and one thing they say is don't worry so much about what your colleagues think. Like if your colleagues think that you're wasting your time, you know, that you shouldn't go do this work, well then, if you're only talking to, like John alluded to, like Kim alluded to, if you're only talking to your colleagues, you're not really doing anything, right? Like that's not meaningful work. It's also some of it is probably a jealousy that you get to do the stuff that they wish they could do as well. So sometimes that comes up. I mean, I once had a colleague tell me everything I do, like this stuff is just extracurricular. Um, I'd say as well, I mean, it's not always easy. I will admit, you know, friendly space that stuff like this really gets me nervous. I get scared every time I have to do one of these webinars. You know, I I can't eat, I mean, John knew me when I gave my first talk and he actually had to force feed me food because I was afraid to eat before my first talk. Um, I think you get better as you do it. And in terms of sort of, I'm probably taking your question in a different direction, I apologize, Delaney, but like, I think if people are saying, if you're worried about doing it and thinking it counts, the benefit of going to the public is you get better you get questions, you get to interact with kinds of people, you get to see how they see the world, which is very different, but also helps your teaching and your research. Um, I cannot count the number of times a random fact I learned from March Memo Madness I've used in class. And the students are like, how the hell do you know the bear cuss cuss does this thing? And I'm like, well, let me tell you about this cool thing that I do. So I think that, you know, it's not, you know, yes, if you're going up, like I'm pre-tenure and I have to worry about service, teaching and research, but they're all kind of mixed together, I think. And yeah, I think the other thing I'll say is echo Kim's point of like, try anything once, right? Like so many things that you might be afraid to do end up opening up a world of things. My random interaction with Katie once when she said they're looking for mammologist to help MMM. And I'm like, oh, I would love to do that. I'm not a mammologist. Maybe someone else wants to do this. And she's like, oh, Mark, do you want to do this? And I, between us, I played it cool for like five minutes. And then I'm like, yes. 
and I came home that day. That day, I also had a paper accepted, and I told my wife I got a paper accepted, and I got invited to MMM, and she cared way more about Marshmallow Madness. Mark, I do not believe you for one second that you played it cool for a full five minutes. <laughs> I think that is a massive over-exaggeration. <laughs> well, no, I meant I didn't, re I didn't reply to her for five minutes. Oh, so this was not an in-person interaction over email. That makes more sense. I now believe it. <laughs> Because I could just see you squealing inside with delight. <laughs> I could follow up here too. I I, uh, I think one of the things that's really useful, especially for trainees, is um, is go and take a look at like the Fizanth Wiki page or whichever area you're looking to get hired in, um, if it's outside the academy, and look at what kinds of skills and um, experiences and uh, values are being looked for. And so kind of navigate how you're allocating your time across these spaces in ways that you can think about, this will go into my cover letter, or this will speak to how I do outreach and diversity and, and equity and inclusion activities, or, you know, have, have um, you know, think about how things fit together like a puzzle. Similarly, I think, especially at trainee stages, the onus is not on trainees to start something de novo. Find something that already exists, so that you don't have to pay the startup and establishment costs and get involved on something that already has a successful footprint and bring your talents and skills to it so that you can leverage the existing strengths at relatively lower costs. And similarly, I think one of the things is that our writing voices are muscles and what, depending on what skills we most need to develop at a particular stage, make sure that you're not swamping those learning opportunities with others, right? So if you're early in your career and you're really learning how to write academically, which sometimes is uh, not the clearest way of writing, um, you can find that there's trade-offs between which muscles you're working. So try and get some balance, just like you would working out. Every day can't be leg day. Um, and so kind of have a bit of a strategic approach. As you become more established in your career, kind of think in ways that are about how, when you do one thing, how can it have traction in other dimensions, right? So now what we do with March Mammal Madness is we systematically survey the way educators are using it in the classroom, and we're getting mixed methods kinds of studies where we have quantitative and qualitative data about how it's impacting different learner communities. And we write papers about that. And so we have things that go into our traditional kinds of metrics that speak um, very strongly, especially to university leadership. And slowly we're bringing along some of the silverbacks in our fields to understanding why these things matter. Thank you for that, Katie. And I would actually like to maybe ping Kim on this a little bit as, you know, someone who's earlier in her career and ask a little bit about the way you've approached this finding opportunities and then the balance, because there are different demands on grad students where everything is very, very much brand new and it can be hard to perhaps balance all of the work you have to get done plus the SciComm you really want to be doing. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just about to say, um, I think balance is, is the biggest challenge, right? When you're starting out, especially because a lot of times the advice I would get was do everything so that you can bulk up your CV. And it's like, never turn one opportunity down. This is the worst possible thing you could do for your career. Like you've got to say yes to everyone and anything. And all that leads to is, is burnout and exploitation because not every opportunity is something you maybe even want to engage in, but you feel that it, you have to just do it because you need something to add to your CV. Um, so I think something that I've picked up along the way is being selective about the types of opportunity. Oh, John, <laughs> I see a baby, a fluffy baby. Um, so being selective about the opportunities based off of what you're interested in, um, which I understand can be really, it's easy to say in hindsight, because when you are in that position and you're just starting out, it seems like every opportunity is a good opportunity. Um, so it, it's a learning process of identifying, okay, this is what I'm more interested in. Or, um, you know, I, I always advocate for financial compensation when it comes to um, your science communication work based. Obviously, it depends on um, who you're working with. Um, if you're working within communities um, that are maybe underserved, you might not want 
that um, kind of charge because I, I don't think any of us would want to exploit communities that we are working closely with. But if it's large corporations or it's um, institutions that can afford to pay for your time and expertise, that should obviously be counted as well. Um, I think it is really difficult because you are discouraged sometimes in academia from engaging in, in science communication. Um, I remember I would constantly be told, well, when are you going to finish your master's if you keep doing all these things? And I actually finished my master's early. And so I never understood what the what the the thinking was behind it, that it was a waste of time because I was gaining skills. Um, I think it does, it tests your communication. Um, we're obviously trained in like academic writing in thinking like an academic, but once you have to change your language and be able to make connections with people outside of that small group that actually understand the jargon you use, um, it really, really helped me improve my communication skills overall. So that also has impact on my professional career. I, I find that my writing for publications has gotten a lot better. I'm able to think more concisely. I can kind of figure out a, a story even within an academic publication. So I think that that's some of, of the advantages of, of engaging in SciComm. Um, I do think though that a lot of people are discouraged because of the way academia is structured. So it's seen as a ancillary to your real job. Um, when, I mean, sharing our findings or sharing our work should be part of the scientific process, um, but it's not viewed as such and it's not treated as such within the academy. So I think as a, a young scholar, that can be really discouraging because you obviously are working towards building your career, possibly in academia, but it's always this, this weird treatment of things that are not lecturing or teaching or just doing research. There's this, you know, alternate careers where it's like, okay, if you are a communicator or you prioritize distributing scientific knowledge beyond the academy, you're not a real scientist. Um, it was actually a question asked to me <laughs> at my job interview when I became the curator at Maruping. Um, I was told, but your CV is geared for academia. You've got strong, you know, you, you can see you're, you're a young researcher who would perform well in academia. And my answer was really simple. I said, I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher. I can do that wherever. I can make science wherever I want to be. Um, and, and who's to say this needs to be the definitive structure of what a career looks like um, in science? So I think there's. There's obviously the issues that are small scale, but also just the structural issues within academia when it comes to science communication. That's a great point, Kim. And, um, you know, in our last webinar, we talked about, um, you know, this apparent and false dichotomy between public health and anthropology with the idea that anthropology is theoretical, public health is applied. You know, they're, they're different, right? But but that really that's a false dichotomy. And um, I sometimes wonder if the reason that public engagement is discouraged is because it's seen as more applied. And, you know, we're, I think in general, we're traditionally trained to really be thinking about theory and, you know, how is our work impacting science rather than how is our work impacting, you know, the public good or, um, you know, the public at large. So I think you make a really good point about, um, you know, despite being discouraged to keep going. <laughs> um, I would yeah. add to that. Can I go? Yeah. I would add to that as well, just that um, I think it's important to realize that sometimes within academia, there's kind of talking out both sides of the mouth that happens where it may seem like something like science communication and, and pursuing more of a public facing strategy might be discouraged, but when you're successful with it, the academy is very in the department that you might be in is very happy to uh be associated with that success and promote that success um most of the all of the the science communication projects that i have gotten myself involved in have been you know, very self-driven and um not necessarily directly related to 
my academic background, I really am a fan of branching out and trying to tackle different kinds of subjects. And I've noticed that once it's out there and once it's doing well, you know, people in the department are very happy to promote that and, and say, oh, look what we're associated with. Um, and and uh, I have a colleague who published a book uh, just a few months ago and um, has been on a bunch of podcasts and, and in, talking with journalists because the book has done quite well. And, um, you know, it, it's on the one hand, you're hearing don't spend your time doing this. But on the other hand, if you do, it can be rewarded and it can be really worthwhile um, and recognized within the academy as well. So, so let's actually talk about that more intentionally right now about trying to get your, your science communication and outreach to count. And so I'm going to ping Katie and John here. But before I do that, I'm going to make the announcement that Michelle Bazanson reminded us of that we need to give a big congratulations to Katie Hine for being awarded the AABA and Leakey Foundation Communication and Outreach Award in honor of Camilla Smith. Congrats, Katie. Well earned, well deserved. Um, however, to get back to where I'm going, um, wanted to get that in there. John, you have a very active blog. And then Katie, of course, you've been getting March Mammal Madness to, to keep going, uh, apparently both through graduate gradualism and punctuated equilibrium, as you say. So a nice little evolution there as well. Uh, ding. Uh, so John with the writing and Katie with the March Mammal Madness, how have you gotten these things to count or be very important towards either your output with publication record or incorporating this kind of thing into grants? Uh, because broader impacts and public outreach and engagement are becoming much more critical parts of grant applications. And so I'm not sure who wants to go first, but have at it. John, Katie is pointing to these you are, so years these, ago. Yeah, this is such an important topic and I'm so glad that we're going to spend a little time on it. Um, awards help. <laughs> Let me tell you, having professional organizations make awards and recognize people in a highly professional venue is extremely helpful to people who are getting started in, in engaged work. And I cannot recommend enough, right? That this is a valuable thing and it matters. Um, the, um, for me, I would say that, you know, when I began really doing a lot of blogging, a lot of stuff that was non-traditional in terms of outreach, um, I, I was afraid. There was a time, you know, when I began this, there was a time when people were being denied tenure for this kind of work. And, and I really thought, you know, I was drawn toward it. I thought I could make a big difference and and it, it was a big success and i can tell you from my experience that i learned a lot about the way that universities and institutions value the work that you do and how to demonstrate that it matters one thing is i think above all central because it applies to everybody and that is know your institution's mission statement and put everything that you're doing in terms of the institutional mission Right, because whatever your department colleagues think, your institution has a statement that they're selling to their alumni and legislatures and and boards of directors. And when you say I fit the statement, you're doing your job. Um, so that's really important. Another really important thing is all of us are innovative. We're all experimenting all the time. I fail way more than I succeed in what I do. And owning your failure and realizing that something that didn't work very well is an opportunity for assessment and understanding and talking about your process in that and learning from it right that makes you a scholar right that's saying i'm not just doing this because it's fun i'm not just doing, i'm doing this because it's meaningful that i'm developing knowledge from it and i'm making a difference having a measurement that or a series of measurements in terms that are relevant to your type of work, to your field is super important. Um, when I had to measure, right, what's, what's the impact of my blog? The measurement that you know, my committee and I came up with was I need to actually know what the number of readers and number of uses are for field specific mechanisms of, at that time, things like the Social Science Research Network, the AAA's Race Project, right? Things that are funded that are, that are recognized as being valuable and important 
and putting your work into that context and saying, this is how this actually ranks is super important. And, uh, and you know, just not being in your own little world, right? You know, making, if you want engaged work to be part of your professional identity, you have to be a professional when you're doing it. You know, it's, it's not, wow, I did this anonymous thing, right? It's, I actually have to own this. I have to make it a part of what I'm doing with scholarship, because if that's, you know, if that's what you find to be important, and I certainly, you know, have always in my career found that to be central to what I do, you know, you have to be able to, uh, you have to bring to it the same kind of professionalism that you bring to your research. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with that. And I think um, I think it's I think it's really clear that um, as we navigate our professional uh, scholarly identity is to to remain um, focused on our values, our philosophies, our principles, our goals and where those overline with our institutions or departments, we make sure we're checking those boxes. But you know, for me, I I don't come from an academic background. My parents did not get college degrees, much less advanced degrees. Um, I grew up in uh, poverty in a community of artists and performers, and I leaned into academia because I had all these things I was quite interested in understanding, and then recognizing that the value of science to me is how it's translated toward improving people's lives and um and so i've kept track of what institutions share my philosophies and values and i'm quite delighted to have landed at a wonderful institution whose mission statement is about that our criteria of success is about who we bring to the table of education and how we support lifelong learning and in that sense, uh, the efforts that I make, um, whether I'm doing outreach to clinicians or families or publicly communicating or working with journalists, or again, I think Marshmallow Madness is one of the particular um, uh, successes that I've been a part of. And you know, the only handwritten note I've gotten from a university president was for the work I've done on Marshmallow Madness. So I think we, we decide to what extent we assimilate. And when we wrote our paper for the academics article, it was written for not only people at the beginning of their career trying to solve these things, but to emphatically remind uh, the established scholars in our fields that outreach and public translation and community engagement are going to be a central value as we make the academy more inclusive. And this is, um, if we fail to recognize how uh, meaningful this is to scholars, how this expands the role and impact of our institutions of higher learning, we, if we don't support that, then, then academia is going to continue being um, an unconnected, undervalued, underrecognized uh, societal resource. And, this is one of the things that routinely, routinely motivates me. I went to community college. I went to a state school for my bachelor's. I went to a state school for my PhD. I went to a state school for my postdoc. Right. My research is funded by the National Science Foundation and, and collaborations with uh, researchers that, that get funded by the National Institutes of Health. Everything about my knowledge and expertise was supported by public funds and is therefore, to me, part of the public trust. Now, this is a complicated space, right? Because there, it's a very kind of European attitude to think that knowledge should be freely shared. And there's many, many communities and cultures in which uh, knowledge is uh, proprietary, and I deeply respect that. So I want us to be very careful about how we think about knowledges and what is shared and what is taken and, and be really thoughtful as we navigate these things. But I also think for me, staying in academia was never my primary goal. I wanted to work on things I cared about and got me excited. And I wanted to do that for as long as I could. And 
that knowledge, knowing that my happiness or well-being isn't contingent on staying at the academic party, was absolutely fundamental for me saying, I'm going to lean into the things that matter to me, because unless I can do that at this party, this is not a party for me. So that's what's been shaping how I navigate this. I just, if I could just quickly pick up on something that Katie said, because uh, as she was talking, I realized, you know, a lot of what she said, you know, coming from outside, not having an academic family, coming from state schools, right? This certainly applies to me, right? That's my life. And I think probably more often than not, people who are engaged in public facing work of all kinds are coming from this background where they have lived the life of translating between two worlds, know how to translate between two worlds. And damn it, colleagues, let us do our work translating. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. so speaking of, <laughs> speaking of, you know, letting us do our work, um, we have a question from the audience um, about basically, you know, what can institutions do for us? So there's a lot, like, I think there's been a lot said about what we can do. You know, we can maybe listen to our colleagues a little bit less. We can, you know, read the mission statement at the university. We can choose how we assimilate or not. Um, but what can institutions like AABA or HBA or the universities uh, do for us to support public engagement and science communication? And yeah, I'm not going to call on anybody. It's just a free for all. So <laughs> whoever feels inspired. I mean, maybe just to go back to what John and Katie were just saying is like, you know, the point of Katie getting a handwritten note saying, good job. I mean, it's silly, but getting those things really do matter, right? I think that even if, you know, promote, not just promoting our work to show how good the institution is, but saying, hey, like, yeah, I mean, you know, not just, or okay, I'll go out there, like, not telling us, okay, those of us in the tenure track can have an extra year on the tenure track, say, let's rethink what it means to need tenure or to get tenure, or however you want to phrase it, right? So I just think, yeah, I mean, and you know what John said with the, about the AABA and these communications and these service awards, that does matter, right? People do see this because, I mean, yeah, I think it's changing and the fact that people want to know this stuff. So yeah, I think the institutions just sort of need us that they need to rethink what academia looks like, right? Because we all know departments are failing or being closed. And I think the greatest, I tell my students, the greatest sadness is for the for eight years in the United States, the president of America of the United States' mom was an anthropologist. And so no one knew what anthropology was. So I think what they need to do for us is, you know, take the work we're doing and sort of, yeah, show it, show us that we're valued, maybe, more than us trying to prove that we have value to them. It would be amazing as well if there were money available. I mean, you know, we're, most of us, I think, all of the work that we're doing, we're doing out of passion and enthusiasm for our research and our disciplines and just science in general and generating excitement about science and making sure people understand the scientific process, as well as the fact that uh, science is not this sort of purely objective thing, but is always filtered through the lens of the people doing the science. And uh, and so we're doing this um, pro bono, essentially, and it would be really fast, uh, fantastic if universities um, made some kind of money available to promote these kinds of science communication efforts. So not just giving awards for it after the fact, but saying, we recognize this is an important thing to be doing. And if you have a project that you're involved in or, or a project that you'd like to pursue, we will make some money available or a pool of money that you can at least apply for available to help support this um, because we recognize it's important. So not simply that we will tolerate it, but that we will actively promote being engaged in these activities. I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, when, you know, when we're publishing in sort of the traditional realm of, of peer-reviewed articles and things like that, obviously there's impact factors. We can kind of judge, you know, what our relative impact is, even though there's some caveats there. Um, 
but I want to know how do you just a little bit. I want to know how do you judge or how do you discern the impact of your public work? And something that comes to mind is like, for me at least, is like I sometimes feel intimidated by by um, people who are doing this really cool, you know, public engagement work because they're, you know, they have the sexy research idea, right? They have the the captivating research idea or the captivating work that you know, maybe says something about our, our evolutionary history or something like that. Whereas others maybe are doing research that's important, no doubt, but maybe doesn't have that like really gripping story. And so I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you judge the impact? And, you know, this isn't a fully formed thought, but like, uh, what's the place for public engagement for research that maybe isn't that like super captivating, like, huge you know impact impactful work well i would say it's it's a matter of measurement and we're professionals in social science and we know that there's qualitative measurements and quantitative measurements and the fact is that you can take you know measures of audiences of you know gathering sizes of the number of people that are hit by something of the number of events that you do right that's one you know measurements right but the other is are you serving communities or a community that is underserved in other ways you know are you facilitating the connections between people in a community that wouldn't exist or that wouldn't have the same kind of of existence if you weren't a part of it and both of those are super important. You know, we can't say that the most impactful work is the work that has the, you know, that has thousands of people watching it all the time. Because the fact is that in my career, I've done both really high numbers work and really small intimate things. And it's often the small intimate ones, especially when, when it makes a difference for a decision maker in a community, especially when it makes a difference for the connection between a local community and a national government or a, a, an international organization, right? Those kinds of things matter to me many times more than anything that I do that hits lots and lots of people. So, so it's being able to contextualize, you know, here's the importance of this in this context qualitatively, and here's the number of people or the number of events or the number of things, right? Here's, here's the numbers. And both of those are important and one may be more important than another for different kinds of, of activities. Any follow-ups to that? Yeah, I would I would also say that um, your research hopefully gets you really excited, right? Your your area of the questions you're working on or it gets you excited either because it's fun or it's meaningful or it a variety of reasons. And like your emotional affect about your research, you can make that infectious, right? So it's um, <clears throat> it's not, there are certain things that are more easily uh, gripping the imaginations of the public. And we know that there's cognitive biases in terms of the things that they're interested in. We know, for example, we've, we've gone through the literature on that kids care more about cute fuzzy mammals than they typically do some of the other taxonomic orders. And so we make sure that in Marshmallow Madness, we have the fuzzy, familiar animals, the charismatic megafauna, and we use individuals' natural cognitive inclination toward those to also slide in really weird, bizarre kinds of animals and, and their adaptations. And so what you can do is you can, you can go to where people are, take where they're, what they know about or what already gets them excited, and then work on getting them excited about the things that you now know about because you've had access to learning about it. And so I think um, I think if you kind of approach, you know, what gets people excited, take what, what's known, and then get them excited about something new. And I think, you know, maybe the audiences won't always be, you know, huge, like we see for like really exciting fossils or chimpanzees, but there's always going to be an audience that is like-minded with you that also gets excited about like fungi and lichen. That everybody is a wonderful example of one of the key tenets of science communication is know your audience. 
and know your goal. That's a really perfect example of that. So thank you for bringing that up, Katie. Uh, we do have a question uh, from William Callison, and this is something that Katie, you had mentioned about March Mammal Madness, but Kim, you might have some things to talk about, and John, um, could you all talk about funding? As we've, we've already said that a lot of times universities, institutions do not support the science communication on the front end. They're happy to award it on the back end. But where do you go to find funds to support your outreach and engagement efforts? Um, I think I could start. Thanks, so. Jim. <laughs> no problem. Um, so within a, a South African context, um, it's actually now been kind of put into legislation that science and scientists have these responsibilities to communicate their work with the public. So um, most grants that you apply for will ask, uh, have you engaged with the public? What are those initiatives? Um, they'll ask specifics about, you know, numbers. Um, you know, obviously the, their goals would be quantitative. They, they'd want to know what this impact is, what the reach is. But most grants um, that are from taxpayer money, as in nationally funded, you do have to account for that. So I think that kind of has pushed researchers in the direction of participating more in science communication efforts. Look, I mean, the, the reasoning behind it might not be the, the greatest. It might just be, you know, related to getting the grant. But I think that it actually was a way of showing people that it's valued. Um, like we were speaking about earlier, what can institutions do? I think that that's something South Africa is um, getting really right in, in the science communication space is that it's now mandatory in, in grants you apply for that are taxpayer funded. Um, in terms of like other organizations, I think that the sad part is it's, it's always like there's a really small pot and a ton of people applying right and everyone has these great projects so there's like a handful of organizations and grants that you know of as a science communicator but it's highly competitive because like i said it's a tiny tiny pot of money and there's like a million of us who would really like to get projects off the ground so that is a major challenge um is kind of convincing funders but through what John and Katie were speaking about earlier, showing the value of this, um, which is kind of like a reverse, you know, why do we have to show you the value for you to invest, but you're happy to brag once you've seen the value of it. So you know the value is there. Um, it's just a matter of getting more organizations to actively contribute towards science communication and towards um, projects. And a lot of issues I've seen is, um, most of the time these are geared towards more established researchers. So as a young scientist coming in or an early career scientist, your science communication efforts are often taken less seriously or your engagement and outreach efforts, even if you could show the numbers are greater than um, someone who is more established. Um, the, the money always tends to go towards the person who is more established. So I think that's something I'm just going to put out there uh, would be great is for kind of um, these funding to kind of be allocated towards younger researchers who are often pioneers in this field. We see it with TikTok. Um, I don't want to name drop, but Tina Lassisi is doing such a fabulous job on, on TikTok. Um, and there are scientists, there are researchers who are in the very early phases of their career, but are really making such a big impact in um, public engagement, but often at their own cost. Katie, I'm going to put you on for March Mail Madness. I'd love to hear how, where you have found funds, how you've applied for it, those kinds of things. We, we are unfunded. Unfunded. March Mail Madness is, is entirely, um, it's an all-volunteer organization. And this is something that has been kind of continuously discussed with uh, different members of, of the group. One of the things is we've looked at funding for like informal learning grants through the National Science Foundation. And they really want, they won't fund the actual tournaments, they'll fund research about the tournament, which then is, in, you know, a ex, you know, huge expansion of, of the bandwidth effort toward it. And, um, and it's also like, I think if, you know, we went back to the first tournament, and I put in a grant and said, 
All right, I have these, you know, uh, evidence-based simulated animal battles that are live announced on Twitter, and many people will get really excited and help contribute, and, and hundreds of thousands of learners will get this from their thousands of educators annually. Um, nobody would have believed that. Right? It wasn't, it, it, it wouldn't have been like that. And I think, you know, and, and, and there's been discussion about whether or not we should become a nonprofit. Well, once you become a nonprofit, you then have to seek funding to perpetuate support for the, the, the effort in ways that may make you vulnerable to making decisions that aren't at the core of what, of what the, the existence and, and goal is. And so, to me, and maybe it's, my dad was a busker. My dad was a street singer. He performed music on the street. People would come and play music with him. And he did that because he had a message that he wanted to get out to the world and accepted tips. And so, um, so my attitude is like, this is a festival that is a gift to the world. And it is an opportunity for a whole bunch of people. Like everybody that's involved in it was either kind of, you know, specifically asked or we sent out a call or they they showed up so like the art team started because karen henning was a tattoo artist and her and her tattoo friends after they got done at work would go to the bar drink beer and watch the tournament on twitter and they wrote to us and they're like hey would you want us to do art of the species that are in the tournament it's like yes we've got like very much it's it's become this kind of kaleidoscope autonomous collective where people are participating because they like the tournament and they're excited to do it. And, and we do have a shop where the artists sell um, their artwork and all those funds go back to the artists. And I think this is a kind of complicated space because I think there should be more funding for this. Um, I think you know it would be really nice if an angel investor showed up and said, what you've been doing with nothing is amazing, right? Like, our educator request form for materials went live less than 48 hours ago, and we have 3,230 requests for materials to reach 300,000 learners, right? And that's that's amazing. Like that's amazing. And but we also want it to be freely available. We don't want it to be corporate. We don't want it to have any agenda other than what those of us building it have. And so I think, you know, there's, there can be really fuzzy lines between hobbies and work. And I don't want to, I don't want to undervalue in any way why it's important for people to be compensated for their expertise. I think that is really important. I think there also can be space for saying, we do it this way and we don't want to do it a different way. And we don't want to be pushed to do it in ways that aren't at the heart of our joy. This is something that I would like to add on to with some experience with science outreach and, and engagement myself. Uh, so the Sausage of Science podcast that Delaney is a, a co-producer and we've had three of the, what, five of you on that show already. Uh, that runs on basically a zero dollar budget. Uh, Chris Lynn and I, there's no compensation for any of that work that we do. However, we did approach the Human Biology Association to get funds to support our grad student producers. And because we're promoting the association and the wonderful work that all of the academics within our association do, they were more than happy to, to support their travel uh, to annual conferences. So that's one way somebody earlier, I think it was Rob, asked how you know the AABA or HBA can help those are ways that they can help, that they can find ways to support grad students or you know, early career faculty who are doing these things, even if it is just giving some money to go to a conference. Um, and also, gosh, I feel like it feels 10 years ago. I think it's only one or two years ago at this point now, uh, but I created a lab manual for my niece for her birthday, which then exploded online and a bunch of people wanted it. And there were book publishers wanting to you know, publish this. And much like Katie, it's like, no, this needs to be freely available. Uh, but then it became a, a much larger project in which we wanted to build kits to give to local schools in the area. And that can't be a $0 budget because you need to be able to buy the things to actually give to the kids. And so that became a, you know, the almost like a panhandling at my university of contacting every little, institute or center or department that might want to have a stake in this to try to gather funds up to actually pull these together and then it gained enough steam that then people started contacting me like 
like with Katie, what can we do to help? We have funds, we want to help you build these kits and deliver them. And so sometimes it is, you just have to make the awkward asks of the various resources on your campus or in your in your profession. And you know, you got to put the pride aside and, <laughs> and try to get that money to, to get kits for kids. And then once you start building it up, then people are going to start contacting you, or at least hopefully that's the that's the potential. Uh, so that's the two cents I wanted to add in there from my own experience, because I have run, I think with the exception of those kits, every science outreach and communication thing I've done has been on a zero dollar budget. And that's almost always how it is. Right, Delaney, what do we have next? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know what is on the horizon in public for public engagement. So um, I know we mentioned um, TikTok, blogs, podcasts, etc. And um, yeah, I'd love to know what's on the horizon. What new formats have you all seen um, that are waiting to you know be cracked open? What's on the horizon for all of you? I'm gonna tag Laura because she's been quiet. Laura, what's next okay. for you? Science communication and outreach. What's new? Um, uh, well, I'm not always the most cutting edge person. So so uh, TikTok is still kind of a mystery to me. I haven't quite dipped a toe in that yet because it's a little intimidating. Um, but I have found, uh, speaking of sausage and science and other podcasts, I have found podcasts to be a fabulous space to be engaging in. Uh, science communication because there is uh, there are as everybody knows sort of a plethora of them out there and they're fantastic in that they all have a slightly different angle and so you can take the things that you're interested in and it doesn't even have to be sort of your own research that you've been you know doing in the field or in the lab you can talk because it's a, aimed at a broad audience you can talk more broadly about the scientific discipline and you can do so using different lenses, depending on the kinds of different podcasts that you've been on. And, um, you know, Carrie, you were talking about swallowing your pride. I have a track record of reaching out to people who have podcasts that I'm like, that's cool. And, and just being like, hey, can I come on your podcast? And it's been remarkably successful. And so I was a guest on the podcast Ologies with Allie Ward. Um, there's a podcast called Just the Zoo of Us that talks about different species of animals. And I went on there and gushed about orangutans for a while. And so I think that um, for me, that space has proved really fruitful for um, having an opportunity to branch out and be able to talk about not always even the same topic, but be able to talk about different topics using different frameworks um, and uh, knowing that they're that they're probably reaching different audiences, and so that's really been something that I've been uh, pursuing myself, um, and uh, and and really been enjoying. So that's that's one thing that I think is is great that's happening now. Not necessarily new, but now. How about Mark? And then I'm going to tag Kim after that. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, like Laura, I can't be the one who's saying what the newest thing is. Um, I guess my thought was, like, I was really impressed by the um, you know, the, the team sort of down at um, the rising star of the virtual reality, sort of digging the site kind of stuff. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, you know, well produced and well edited and put together YouTube clips. So many of my students are like, oh, here's this YouTube video that I saw where I learned this thing or you know, a lot of the sort of, the, maybe the shorter sort of documentaries that are put on there. So I think that maybe the space is not, say, the newest technology, but working with other teams, right? Like finding your people who can help you. Okay, I wanna, like Lara said, go on the podcast, but then find people who are really good at it, right? I mean, Natalia Reagan is really, really good at sort of communicating with humor and comedic value, learning from them, and then, yeah, creating the late, I mean, you know, creating an app that does something cool or doing, you know, a podcast. You know, there's a glut of all this stuff. So I think it's just finding that niche to fill. So yeah, maybe first, I think it would be really cool if someone did like an app to teach. I, ha I had my students try to do this once. They're gonna make a an app where they sort of geolocate where sites are. And it failed, like John said, it failed spectacularly. 
but we learned a lot while doing it. So I think that kind of stuff would be really cool. Kim, and then we'll go to John to hear what new things he's up to. Um, so like John mentioned, um, when I forgot it in my introduction, Kim, um, I've been made a superhero. I've been turned into a superhero by a local organization called Super Scientists. Um, and essentially what they do is they turn South African scientists, especially those from underrepresented groups, um, into super scientists. So you get your own character and you kind of look like a, a Marvel character. It's, it's super cool. They give you like a six pack. It's wonderful. It's such a, it's such a boost on all, all fronts. Um, and these um, super scientists are turned into trading cards and trading cards are distributed at local schools um, for free. Uh, so we've gotten a calendar. Every year we get a, a, a calendar which has all of the latest scientists featured um, and it's like a STEM themed calendar. So it will have like different, you know, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, or all of these really notable days in science. And it covers a broad field. It's, it's astronomy, there's evolution, there's microbiology, there's medical doctors. It's, it's really just such a fantastic initiative and there's also activity books that are created for kids and those are distributed to schools it's run by an incredible incredible man justin yarrow um, who just has put so much blood sweat and tears into this project and making sure that it is available to all south african kids um, so that project is growing and actually we are proceeding with our first 16 page comic which is super exciting um, so it's been turned into an official comic book um, and we've received funding for that project. So we're kind of in the, the stage of trying to um, plan the storyline, which is always a fun, a fun conversation because it's like, oh, put all the science in. And he's like, this is for kids. The kids don't care. It's like, no, it has to be a certain the book because it's found in those deposits. And he's like, they don't know. <laughs> so we can play around with this stuff. And I think he's, he's teaching all the scientists who are on the team quite a, a lesson in, in what children like in comic books. Um, so that's something that we're busy with now. Hopefully this project will be published later this year and, and we could share that. Um, and also, I think from a South African perspective, it tends to be a lot different to our colleagues in the North or the situations um, in the North, because within South Africa, we have a very large demographic who don't have access to cell phones or to um, internet or to Twitter or uh, have data to download. Our data costs are ridiculous. I won't get into that now, but I'm inside. I'm just seething at the amount of money I spend on, on data. Um, and so it's become more, for me, more important to start looking at um, ways of using traditional media like radio, uh, which a lot of homes have access to, um, to try to kind of boost um, the, the presentation of science and, and the accessibility to science within South African communities. So it's we're kind of doing a reverse where it's going back to traditional media and seeing what we can do differently or seeing how we can approach traditional media to reach more people. Um, and I think another big push that we are exploring here is uh, translating work into different languages. We have 11 official languages in the country, but um, English is not even the most widely spoken and it is the only real way that science is communicated in South Africa, that and um, Afrikaans, which is also still um, quite a small demographic of people actually speak Afrikaans. So uh, there's amazing organizations like Science Link and the work of a science communicator by the name of Sibusiso Biela. And he is actively looking at translating science into Zulu, Isi Zulu, um, so that we can start reaching more people in their language and seeing um, better representation and getting our young academics involved in science communication within their own communities uh, where they can speak their own language and um, that really seems to make such an impact because it's pointless me spewing on in English all the time um, when the, that, the, that connection is not there. 
so, so that's something that we're looking at in a South African context is really trying to go back to um, our roots and our foundation and to make science more accessible, but also more local, more South African, instead of kind of applying Western um, concepts or Western ideas to how we should be communicating our science. We're kind of in this really interesting phase where we're working it out for ourselves and it's such a fun period of experimentation and we're learning through engaging with our communities and so that's where I hope we keep moving towards is being uniquely African in the way we talk to each other. All right, John, what's on the horizon for you? Well, I'll tell you with uh, with the work that I do and uh, and the work that I do, you know, t telling you know people about you know, our science. I always face the challenge whenever I'm consulting with a museum, whenever I'm consulting with documentary. The challenge is that paleoanthropology has these iconic objects that are so visually stunning and recognizable, and and they tell a story, right, in a visual way. Genetics, which is increasingly important to our understanding of human origins, is totally impenetrable visually. Right? There's nothing you can do with genetics in a visualization um, effectively yet that tells a story accurately. And people bring to it so many misconceptions, misconceptions rooted in race and racism, misconceptions rooted in, um, in, in misunderstandings about the way that genealogy works. And so it's so incredibly important to find ways to tell accurate stories that are stories that are evocative, that allow people access to it. And so I've been working to combine those two worlds for a long time and to think of better ways to visualize and to allow people to understand visually and through storytelling. Um, I can mention a couple of things. Mark said, you know, we have this VR stuff and we are working very hard on virtual reality accessibility for fossil sites, paleontological, archaeological sites, um, their heritage sites, and we can't have everybody walking through them. I work in a site that I can't enter. <laughs> and so the fact is that uh, using the data that we've collected to make, uh, to make effective visualizations is super important. We have distributed 3D models of fossils uh, and, and research quality 3D models freely. Anybody can get these from Morphosource. And I can, I can share that we're doing a lot with virtual models now in our classrooms at the University of Wisconsin. We do have, and if people don't know it, I have a lab website that has uh, virtualization models that are totally manipulable, that do cool things. Um, and John, you need to send that link in the chat so everybody can have access. Yeah, I will. I will. I will drop that in the chat. It's hominin anthropology with study to you. Um, and so people can can use these for their classes. It's on my lab website because the university is footing the bandwidth. So <laughs> I hope that people will use it. We do have a lot of classic teaching examples there. I do use these in my courses. We use them with K-12 outreach. Um, finding ways to build augmented reality so that people can access sites and see beyond the objects. And I want to mention Adam Van Arsdale is doing some amazing work with virtualization of fossils and thinking of ways to do virtual labs, right? And finding ways to do storytelling with that is important to me. And finding ways to visualize genetics in ways that allow storytelling that goes beyond sort of these sort of misunderstandings, I think is super important to me. So that's where that's what I have on the horizon. Thank you for that. And I'm sure everyone will love to get their hands on those teaching resources from your website. So thank you for putting that together. I, I think as a, a good way to wrap this up, I'm gonna combine a question from the audience. Rob O'Malley has a question with one that we had kind of planned. So we are still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, we are all burned out. We are all overextended. And yet we all do wanna keep doing the various science communication and outreach because we know how important it is and perhaps more important now than ever, at least it's highlighting how important it is now. Uh, and so kind of two parts of this. One is, you know, not a day goes by where I don't get another ask to do, you know, at least one more service thing, if not 10 in a day. And, you know, my plate is already so full. Uh, but when it comes to science communication, when you get these asks, how do you 
how do you choose what's going to be the best opportunity to help you along the way? And then to kind of combine Rob's question into this is uh, what resources or training experiences and networks should especially early career scientists uh, be looking at for, for plugging into science communication or engagement skills? And so one, how do you choose? But two, if you can't, you don't have like people giving you asks all the time or making asks all the time, how do you get yourself plugged in? So how do you kind of begin that science outreach career? Katie, is that an I wanna take this? Go for it. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so what I recommend everybody do, regardless of your career stage, is sit down and make a list of things that you would like to accomplish in the next five years, right? And so like, be, like for example, I get asked to speak quite frequently and so I had like, you know, my dream things that I wanted to say yes to. And then those happened and I was like, okay, well now I need some new goals. And so I started prioritizing going and visiting places that are less likely to be visited, right? So North Dakota has been on the list for a long time, but we keep having to push the talk because of the pandemic. But, but really think about like, okay, what are the things that you wanna do in all areas of your scholarship and keep a checkbox list right and when you check something off when you get asked to do something that's too similar to it or overlaps that is going to inhibit you from saying yes to something that is currently unchecked it helps you not think about each of these asks in isolation you can actually have kind of a structured planned diversified professional portfolio and and if you've mapped out five years it, it gives you some wiggle room so you can think okay in the next year i'm doing x y and z so I'll say yes to A, B, and Cs, right? And, and I think that that right there just helps you recenter yourself so that you're less vulnerable perhaps to um, cultural messaging you're getting from your local environment or perceptions of the messaging. And, and it really helps you take a lot more ownership. And, and especially like we've heard, you can reach out to those places and say like, you know, what, um, do you have any seminar speaking opportunities coming up or you know do you need a guest essay on sapiens or do you you know are you going to do a trainee focused science of, you know sausage of science podcast right like you can you can basically start moving the chess pieces to align with the path you are trying to navigate and and i, I think it, it helps you kind of step back and think with intentionality what are the trade-offs of yeses and nos and always err on the site of um, finding ways to say no really nicely. Um, so one of the things I, I often do is say like, that's amazing, I would love to do that. Can we plan it for at this point in the future? Because I just can't add it to my calendar and maintain my own well-being at this time. So, so, so uh, a postponing yes always sits more comfortably, I think, than an outright no. And, and so that is um, that's a technique I encourage everybody to develop. And I'll add just uh, that I think Katie in particular is fantastic and also passing along opportunities because not everybody has as many people knocking on their door as Katie does. And so she, I think, is really great at uh, when people approach her for an opportunity, if she's not available or it's not within her bandwidth, she does a really good job of saying, I can't do it, but here's a list of people who you can contact, who probably do have some availability. And so I would say that if you are looking for those kinds of opportunities, connect with the people who are being contacted so that they know that if they're not available, you are interested in building up your skill set in this uh, regard and building up this portion of your CV. And they, you can get opportunities passed your way uh, through that as well. And I'll also add that for me personally, Twitter has been phenomenally useful in terms of networking um, in the general SciComm community. I think that for the most part, the people I've interacted with, the scientists on Twitter, again, we're enthusiastic. We wanna talk about our science. And, um, and the same is true about professional science communicators on Twitter. And so I have had very good luck with just blindly reaching out to people and saying, here's who I am, here's why I'm interested in what you do, let's get to know each other, let's form a connection, um, and just not being afraid to, to put yourself out there and, and say, I wanna be a part of this space, what can I do to make that happen? 
I can say from personal experience as someone who co-hosts a podcast, I love when people contact us asking to be on. It takes a lot of effort off of us trying to identify people. So please email us if you want to be on the podcast. Uh, Mark, Kim, John, anything to add? I can just say a really, in terms of like the getting better, I think you sort of add like, how do you just get better at it? Like, where do you get go for advice? I say, you know, not that I'm any great at it, but I'm happy to help. But like, I, I will say that just because as much as she hates being embarrassed, like I got asked to do this documentary thing. And then I messaged Katie and like, I clearly, she probably was writing a paper with another hand and it sends me this list of like, here's how you do a documentary well. So I think it is find people who are, you know, who've done the things that you want to do and reach out because the fact is very few people actually ask us for that help. So like, yeah, I just say like, because then like you said, it gets you used to it. And I'll say as well, um, it got kind of a lot of attention on Twitter the other day. Like also keep a list of like saying no to things, right? Cause you don't have unlimited time. You don't have unlimited resources and not everyone owes parts of you for things. So yeah, I think, and like, yeah, say when, when you say no, I also like to say, okay, I can't do this all, but my, my colleague down the hall does a very similar thing, probably much better than I do. So let me connect the two of you. I 100% agree with what everyone has said, um, especially Laura about Twitter. I think I come across most of my opportunities um, work-wise on, on Twitter. Um, I made a Twitter connection and, and that's how I got to write for eons. I asked about um, writing for sapiens. It's it's all um, kind of getting into that network um, that I think is really important, especially when you're just starting out because firstly, it's really overwhelming. Um, and I know for myself, I was really shy because it's like, oh, there's these great science communicators. And, and I know I've done this to John before um, where I was like, I was just so scared to approach you because you're someone I admire whose work I admire and who I think does a really great job of it. So there's that fear that comes into play but like Lara has been preaching and I am taking it with me when I leave here is just go for it just do it um, and I think that that's really important is oftentimes I think we we think people would be nastier than they actually would be um, or that you'd be dismissed really easily um, and that's often not the case I think a lot of people especially in in the science communication, engagement community are really open because I think we're all in this, you know, time of, of trying to figure things out and trying to do our best um, in this field. So it is really welcoming. I would say for anyone who wants to start out, it's, it's find that community, um, whether that's on Twitter or it's an Instagram thing or TikTok, which I don't even, I haven't even started exploring that. But it's really important to find that community because not only are you using that network to gain access to opportunities, but it's also like Mark just mentioned, it's it's access to knowledge, it's access to experience, it's access to mentorship, it's access to just this, this entire world of science communication. So building up that network, building up a support system is really important. Um, people who know, oh, hey, this might be an opportunity that's good for Kim, or you know, this might be something you're interested in, so I'm gonna pass it your way. That's always really helpful. Um, and I think in terms of saying no, I've made this my official year of no, which is the most difficult thing I think I've ever done um, because I do need to finish up my core PhD. So um, it is my official year of no, um, which I really struggle with because uh, I think science communication is something that brings me so much joy. And it's something that ignites, it reignites the sparks when it comes to my my actual research work. Cause I feel like I feel so motivated and reinvigorated once I've had a really positive experience of communicating my science or I've challenged myself to communicate my science. Um, but like we're all discussing here, you need to know your own bandwidth and you can't sacrifice yourself, your mental health, your time, um, your family, the other things in your life that bring you joy um, purely for project after project. So I think like Katie was saying, it's important to prioritize, to know what your goals are and where you want to be and what contributes towards them. And a gentle no 
I, I have found since I've had to say no quite often um, lately, a gentle no really works and people will come back to you. I, I, I said no to talk last year and actually was approached again by um, the organization because it, like you said, it was a gentle postponement. Can we please do this at a later date? Because I am interested, I just can't do it at the moment. So definitely important to be really honest um, about what you can and can't do and, and to still remember you deserve your own time as well. And can I just jump in and follow up on that excellent point that Kim made, which is um, a really great tactic to motivate your nose is to create a no CV. So, you know, we have this big goal to build our, you know, always, you know, N plus one, N plus one, N plus one. And so it can be hard to like get into the psychological mindset of, of, of declining opportunities. And so if you build a no CV, you can start tricking your mind into being psychologically motivated to add stuff. Um, to fight that fear of missing out, you can put it on a no CV. And, and early in my career, I had that sister document and it helped me very much. Yeah, I've seen a, a lot of folks on Twitter talking about the no CV. So thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> Are there any other thoughts, John? Do you have any thoughts before we wrap up? You know, I can't give better advice than you've already heard. I would say that from my perspective, I'm, I'm a little older than, than some of the other folks. I spend a lot of time thinking about, is this the right use of my activity right now, right? And is this something I can make a unique differences in? Is this something that isn't gonna happen unless I'm involved? Is this something that's gonna go terribly wrong unless I, <laughs> I, I put my hand in it? Um, or is there another voice that should be in this that, that's not mine? And, and with documentary production, it's always this, I'm always consulting and often it's like, you don't want me on the screen, right? Here are the amazing people that you should have. And I'm always looking for the people that this is gonna be, right? I'm always looking for whose voices should be out there that people should be hearing from. Our science, our field is vastly stronger when it's lots and lots of voices and not the same voices again and again. And, and I think really hard about how can we get more people? How can we empower them? How can we give them voice? How can we you know, make sure that 15 years from now, we have a crew of people who have experiences with working with the public so that they're carrying things forward, right? And, and if you're one of those people, if you're out there and thinking, you know, I really want to be you know, engaged in, in ways that I'm not now, and I wanna think about that, I would really love to hear from you. And I know that any of us on the panel would really love to hear from people. Um, because we have insights, but we don't know everything. And what we can do is give some perspective of how did we make this work? What mistakes did we make? And, and how, do you, how do you make sense of all of this? Well, thank you so much. This was a great webinar and um, I definitely feel inspired by all of you. And I think our audience probably does too. Um, and the great thing about these webinars is that they'll live on YouTube, so many people will continue to watch them and, and feel inspired as well. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much. And also thank you to AABA and HBA for supporting this webinar series and allowing us the, the space to do this. Um, thank you also to the Burke Associates for getting all the tech set up and, and um, making this a very smooth webinar. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you all. Nice seeing Thank your faces. You so Good job, everybody. <laughs>